I know you touched on it on the weekend, um, but can you put into words uh, what it's been like um, for you to see what, what's happened in Minneapolis um, last week and since, since the, uh, the murder? Um, yeah, I think, you know, what I said on Twitter is, is the gist of it. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, clearly it's, it's hit home. Um, you know, never did I envision that Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know, my hometown would be the epicenter of these things happening. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of, um, I have a lot of family there. Obviously my wife has a lot of family there. We have a lot of friends there and, you know, there's a lot of people are scared. People, you know, were scared. And, um, you know, I think the, you know, the overwhelming, um, majority has been a really positive response. You know, you, you, if you watch the news and you see, you know, tons of peaceful protests and, and people, you know, clearly upset, clearly sick and tired of the same conversation, but, but doing it in a way that um, is promoting real change. Unfortunately, um, that's not the case with everyone. Unfortunately, there, there are people that are taking advantage of those situations and um, doing some, some destruction to people who have worked a, a long time to establish, you know, small businesses and, um, so that's been really heartbreaking. I mean, getting, getting pictures from our family of, um, businesses being boarded up, you know, where I'm from, which is, you know, 20 minutes outside of Minneapolis. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, it's, it's really tough, but, um, for the most part, I'd say I'm, I'm proud of my hometown for the response and, and for the people standing up and, and not tolerating, um, not tolerating this anymore and, and helping each other clean up the mess that was made by the unfortunate people that, uh, you know, took advantage of the situation. And I will ask one follow up. Um, a few people have said it started, I think with Evander Kane on Friday and, and I spoke with Milt Stiegel yesterday and he really felt strongly too that, um, that white professional athletes and the higher profile, the better uh, need to speak up as well that it makes a difference. It's not just the African-American population that needs to speak out against this. What role do you think white professional athletes like you can play in, in this issue? We, we, have, we have to, you know, we have to be as, um, you know, involved in this as, as you know, black athletes. It, it can't just be their fight. Um, you know, when Colin Kaepernick was, you know, taking a knee during the national anthem and, you know, trying to do it in a peaceful way in 2016 and trying to, you know, raise awareness to this in a peaceful manner. Um, you know, unfortunately there wasn't more, you know, and, and, you know, I want to be real clear here. I, I, I look in the mirror about this before I look out at, at everyone else. You know, I, um, I wish that I was more involved sooner than I was. I wish that, you know, it didn't take me this long to, um, to get behind it, um, in, in a meaningful way. But, um, I guess, you know, the, what you can do is, is try to be better going forward. So, you know, that, that's kind of been my position on it is, is I want to, I want to be a part of the change going forward. And, um, you know, whether that resonates with everyone, whether that spreads with everyone is, is clearly, you know, we're, I'm only one person, but, you know, I do have a small platform to, to try to promote this and promote change. And, and, you know, I, I agree with what Kaner said. I, I think he, um, he did a phenomenal job. And to be completely honest with you, Kaner, you know, he was on this, even when I played with him, you know, he, he was saying these things, even when I played with him and, um, so I, I really apl applaud him for the work he's done and, and the job he's done kind of being the, the voice of this movement, especially in our sport. Hi, Blake. This is Carter Brooks, Game On Magazine. Um, a big part of who you are is being a father. And you've referenced this many times. You've told us how important family is to you. What have you said to your kids about what's going on in your hometown and many of the states down south? We're, we're showing them, you know, we're, we're showing them what's going on on TV. I mean, um, 
they they watched you know George Floyd die on TV. Um, so that's that's been really challenging trying to explain, especially to Louis. I mean, Louis seven. He's he's really you know Lenny and Mace are you know five and three almost, and so it doesn't quite um, register as much for them. But for Louis, I mean, you know, he's asking why you know why won't he get off his neck? Why won't he get off his neck? And to have to explain that to him, um, to try to explain to him that, you know, uh, to a seven-year-old that the, you know, police that he feels are out there to protect us and look out for us, that that's not always the case. I mean, that's a hard conversation to have. So, um, you know, Sam and I have talked and we're, it's too bad that we're not in Minneapolis. I mean, we would have, we would have, and it's too, and, and clearly during a pandemic too, um, you know, our first responsibility is the safety of our kids. And, but, we, you know, we would have loved to, to take our family out to the protest to show them, you know, how powerful it can be and, you know, really what a beautiful thing it was, um, all the people coming together in our hometown. So we've talked about it a lot and showed them as much as we can to, to just try to, continue that education and, you know, try to show them and, and, and really have it be, you know, imprinted in their mind that this is what it should look like. And follow up, obviously, making social media posts, giving statements publicly, talking about things, obviously talking about what you would do with the family. Um, what more can you and other professional athletes do in this time where we're seeing posts on social media, such as Blackout Tuesday, where it's a black screen? What more can be done? at this time? You know, we, as pro athletes, we have a platform. I think that, that in and of itself is a, is a big step to, to put yourself out there and, and talk about it. And, you know, it, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, I did kind of my first uh, sort of discussion about it yesterday um, with, you know, with TSN and um, it was hard. It was hard to, to talk about that and, and, feel comfortable talking about it. And I think it's something that over time, you know, we need to, to be more comfortable doing, but um, you know, we need to be okay voicing our opinion on this. You know, I, I strongly feel that this has nothing to do with politics. You know, you can vote for whoever you want. You can have your opinions about policy and Republican, Democrat, all that. But I mean, these are human rights fundamentally, you know, there should be Republicans who are on board with this Democrat, like we should all agree on this. Um, so, you know, I think, I think using your platform and I think if you're American, you need to be very educated and, and, and vote, you know, not just for the national election, not just for the president, but in your local votes, you know, state, city, county, um, all these ways that, you know, we can try to change the system and, and put the right people in power so that these things aren't happening anymore. Hey, thanks, Blake. Uh, Josh Clifford here with CP, as Scott said. I'm just wondering, from your perspective, why now? Why are white athletes standing up now? Racism has been around as long as time. In your sport, you know, you talked about Evander being on top of it. Akeem Alou shed light on it in the fall, and then, and then again in his Players' Tribune article. I'm wondering why, why you think now is the time that everyone's stepping up. And like I said, I can only speak for myself. So, you know, I haven't done a good enough job in the past. I've felt this way for a long time. Um, and I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, I'm not going to pretend like it's an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to talk about. And so there's a bit of being uncomfortable and scared to put yourself out there. But um, to answer your question directly, I think, you know, going back a few weeks to, you know, the, the murders in, in Georgia and, and watching that on TV. And then you're watching this on TV. I think putting um, a, a visual to what's being talked about, I think has changed for a lot of people. You know, I think, I think you read about it and you hear about it and you know, it's injustice and you know how horrible it is. But then once, once you see it, you're able to, it puts it in a, in, a, in a new light and um, you know, being involved, being in a pandemic right now where people, you know, there's no other distraction, you know, we're not preparing for a game tomorrow. You know, my, our minds don't go elsewhere. 
right now. Like we're, we're able to, to really digest this. And I think that that has, has made it to the point where guys just, you know, you can't be silent anymore. I know you touched on this in your, in your post, but I mean, how worried are you about, about your country, the, the rhetoric, um, 40 million people out of work, it just seems like it's as divided as it's been in multiple generations. Um, yeah, terribly, honestly. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm typically kind of a worrier, typically kind of an anxious person. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, yeah, you know, like you said, there, there, there's so much, so much hurt out there. There are so many people that don't have jobs that, um, have families that don't know where their next meal is coming from. It's, you know, the list seems never ending and, and on top of it, you know, we're still treating people this way, like during a pandemic, during, you know, something that hasn't been seen in, in, in lifetimes, you know, to have a country be going through this, um, economically, socially, everything. And then we're still, we're still, you know, treating each other like this. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's worrisome. The, the, you know, being American growing up though, you know, I truly believe that, that better days are ahead. And, um, you know, through that anxiety and through that fear and through kind of that worry, you know, about, about the country, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful about the future because I think this is, you know, I, I got a text from my dad yesterday or two days ago. And, you know, he was telling me he grew up in Detroit about the, the race riots in, in Detroit in the, in the late sixties. And he just said, you know, we, my generation didn't get it right. And hopefully yours does. So I'm hopeful my generation and my kids generation fix this and, and, and get this country um, so that there's brighter days ahead. Blake, Jess Myers from The Rink Live, thanks for doing this. Um, wondering twofold, number one, the Canadian border remains closed to most traffic. I'm wondering if that's affected you and, and your family in any way. And number two, uh, the rinks in Minnesota have started opening up a little bit. I'm wondering if you've been on the ice at all or if you're uh, hoping to get on the ice soon. Yeah, I'm, um, you know, the, the border being closed is gonna affect us more going back to Canada. You know, we've been down in, um, you know, just um, Minnesota we, has been our um, summertime home in about five or six years now. We've, we've been coming down to South Florida, um, you know, so it's more of a spend a few weeks to see friends and family in Minnesota in the summer. Um, but um, yeah, so the, the border closing is going to affect us more getting back into Canada. You know, there's really strict uh, laws getting back into the country and the quarantine and, and all those types of things um, that we we need to weigh. But um, yeah, I've been able to get on the ice a little bit down in Florida. The the rinks, you know, we're able to open up once uh, Palm Beach County reopened in phase one. So um, yeah, I've been able to find a little ice down here. Hi, Blake. Murat from The Athletic. Thanks for doing this. Um, I'm wondering if you've had a chance to kind of reflect on um, you mentioned having a platform and you certainly have a big one. And I noticed in roughly the day or so after your, your tweet in your own words, then we get, uh, you know, Mark Shifley speaks up on Instagram, Jansen Harkins adds some words as well. Um, have you had conversations with your teammates or are you noticing how your voice is propelling other people to also add theirs? Um, no, honestly, I mean, that's the honest truth. Um, you know, um, yeah, no. And as a, I guess as a follow-up to that, and thank you for the honest truth, of course, is uh, just in in terms of your experiences as, as a hockey player growing up or even at the professional level, um, what have your experiences with racism been like? Um, you know, you know, as a as a kid, um, there were a couple of incidences that stood out. You know, having having black teammates, um, and uh, you know, some things happened from the opposing team and handshake lines and and whatnot. And and um, I just remember the you know the pain, you know, crying and and being upset and mad and 
that this isn't me. This is my teammate I'm, I'm speaking of and, and seeing how hurt, you know, that made him, um, you know, forever was burned into my brain. And I was so sad for him, you know, that, that somebody could say something to him to make him feel like that. So that would, that would be, you know, my experience with that in terms of, you know, seeing it from a teammate's perspective, you know, as a kid, um, you know, in the, in the NHL and, and I, I can't, it, it would, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the guy, the guys that have had to deal with it on a more personal level, even some of, you know, I've had teammates, you know, Vander Kane and, and Buff um, in particular, you know, they would have to speak on that. You know, I've always, I've always felt like um, the teams I've been on, it hasn't been, a, you know, a thing. It's, it's been, you know, we respect what you do as a player. We respect, you know, what you are as an individual, you know, cause sports is, is, that doesn't matter in sports. Color doesn't matter at all. You know, it's about, you know, what you bring to the team and how you perform. And especially when you get on the ice, I mean, there's, there's no, it's all about the, it's all about the game. And, um, you know, those guys would probably have different views on that. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that they agree with that, that, you know, our environment has always been, you know, accepting everyone's differences and, and having it be, you know, an inviting environment to be a part of. But like I said, you know, my perspective and somebody else's might be completely different. Morning, Blake. I hope your family is doing well. Thanks for taking the time. I know it's tough to talk about hockey or even think about hockey at a time like this, but what was your initial reaction to the return to play and, and what are the biggest challenges uh, in the next phase uh, before the players are going to be willing to sign off and, and get back to being on the ice and going to training camps? I think, you know, there, there's, there's not going to be a perfect formula just the way it is, you know, no matter what you do, nobody, you know, somebody's going to be unhappy. So I think you try to, you know, weigh as many positives as you can and come up with a solution that is going to check as many boxes as you can. Um, you know, there's still a lot of hurdles to, to go, you know, we still have a lot of things to figure out, you know, mainly, the safety of the players, you know, I don't think anyone's a real big fan of, um, you know, especially I can speak personally, um, you know, having three small children in the house and doing it as a team with, with Sam um, is really challenging and thinking about her doing it alone, you know, um, would be really tough. So those are, those are things that are really important to the players. Um, you know, we gotta, we gotta make sure that our safety is at the, top of that list because you know we're a few months into this pandemic we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be and um you know so there, like I said a lot, lot of questions to be answered but I think it's trending in the right direction and um you know the sentiment I get from all the guys is we would you know we want to get back on ice on the ice for our fans and try to bring some something positive to to people's lives and, and give them something to look forward to. That That's the ultimate goal. Thank you. And just uh, maybe some quick thoughts uh, on the prospective series with the Flames. Thank you. I, I, I haven't, I mean, they're, they're a good team. They have good players. Um, it'll be, it'll be a good matchup, but um, you know, uh, it, once we get into camp and get our team together, we can start focusing on, on them. Um, haven't really done a whole lot of thinking about that yet. Hi Blake, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. Um, just one more on on the uh, initial issue we we're talking about when Akeem Alou, uh, Did you read his Players Tribune uh, piece? Did you have a chance? Uh, yeah, I saw, I saw some of it. Okay, he um, he spoke a bit about what he called sort of tribalism in hockey, or that the players there's there's a culture. He said where players from a very young age are essentially taught to kind of go with the pack, to, to not stand out, to not have personalities, to be robotic. Um, you obviously played with one of the biggest personalities in the sport in, in Dustin Bufflin, but it does seem if you look at hockey that those types of individuals there are few and far between and there are more people that just sort of go with the flow and, and don't necessarily speak out on issues. Do you feel there is this ingrained culture in hockey that 
Um, you don't stick your neck out on anything for fear of kind of what the what the machine will will think about it. I th I think I think it's accurate what you know what he's you know what he's describing in terms of that, and I think um, my opinion is that there's a reason you know the reason for it is I think hockey is the ultimate team game. You know, it doesn't matter if you're the best player in the world if if you don't if you're not on a good team, it doesn't matter. You know, I think um, in other sports, you know, having a phenomenal pitcher or being, you know, the best best player on the court in basketball, I think those those might impact the game differently than, you know, being the best player on the ice in a hockey game, you know. So with that being said, I think that there's always, um, you know, guys have such a respect for the work that their teammates do, you know, you – you don't want to, you don't want to put yourself on a pedestal for, for doing something above and beyond when, you know, a guy blocking a shot or a guy taking a hit or a guy standing up for a teammate and fighting is in our game is, is equally as important as the guy that goes end to end and scores a goal. Um, so I think that's why the culture is how it is. You know, I, I think that, you know, whether I have a four goal game or not, um, I don't look at it as me being the difference in the game. I, I look at there's so many other reasons why we won the game, you know, than than just the guy who puts the puck in the net or the guy who's, you know, quarterback in the power play. So in my opinion, that's why hockey is the way it is. Um, and, and also a little bit, I think the league, um, um, you know, with some of the, the money off the court in other sports, you know, the, the player, like, you know, people cheer for um, LeBron James. They don't cheer for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, right. They cheer for whichever team LeBron goes to. Uh, how many Tampa Bay Buccaneers fans are there now with Tom Brady going down to, to Tampa? So I think in, a, in, in all the other sports, the stars are bigger than the team in, in a lot of senses now. And I think a lot of that is, is money driven. I think, you know, uh, these, these guys can sign one year contracts and, and, and kind of see which team is is the next best one to go to because of the amount of money they're making off the court too, you know? So I think, I think, you know, the leagues have had to embrace that and embrace the fact that the star players are in a lot of ways, they're more, more important than the franchises now. That's the way it's gone. And then just to follow up on the return to play scenario um, from Kenny's question is, is the ability to have say family Blake, whatever kind of bubble situation is created is will the ability to have family be with you or, or to at least see family during that time. Is that a deal breaker in your mind, as opposed to the idea of being isolated potentially for two plus months? Well, I'm more, I'm more concerned about my family being safe than I am about me being with them. Um, you know, I, I don't have a good example of a, a situation that, you know, I'd bring my family to, but, you know, um, I would, I would prefer them to have more freedom to like move around and potentially see, you know, a friend or two here or there than just be confined to a hotel room and, you know, being able to walk down the street a little bit, I, you know, having a, you know, three kids under seven, um, that's not really a great way to spend a few months for them either. So, um, listen, we're, we're working, you know, we're complaining about or and talking about things that are pretty insignificant here. Um, I want to be real clear about that, but I think all the guys with families are, you know, are, are, are worried about, you know, what, what are, what are our wives going to do when we're gone for that amount of time and, and just kind of leaving them, leaving them out to dry. I think it's maybe a little bit more about that than just the ability to, to see them and, and have them close to us. Hey, Blake. Yeah, Scott Billick here, obviously, uh, Winnipeg Sun. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, you, can, you mentioned it in your Twitter tweet, and a lot of players have mentioned that it, it, it's so difficult to kind of put into words how, how people are f feeling. And I guess, you know, especially as, as, as white people who don't, you know, understand the, you know, what, what black people have gone through. But why is it so difficult for, do you think, why was it so difficult for you to kind of put into words what you're feeling? I've never had to do it before, you know, um, and 
you know, um, I've, I've obviously in private, you talk, you know, I talk to my wife and she knows how I feel and I know how she feels. And, um, you know, you want to, you get, you really get one chance to do it the first time you want to make sure that you're, it's being portrayed how you actually feel, you know, because in the court of public opinion, I mean, go, go look at my, for the record, I don't do this because I, I, I just don't have time to scroll through all the replies, but I bet you if you go through what people are saying back to me, um, it's not, there's not a consensus on it. You know, there's, so, so you got to throw that out the door. You can't try to please people and you got to just figure out deep down how you're feeling and then try to put that into words. And, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience doing that, especially at the magnitude that this is. So it, it took a little while to, you know, cut through all that and, and just get down to how you feel and, and what you feel and, 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 and try to put that into words. Follow up. I mean, yeah, you talked about the kind of maybe a bit of the backlash and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I guess sometimes it's too, you have to make sure that, you know, what you say is like, and you talked about this, I mean, you, you have one chance to kind of get it right or whatever. Do you think that's part of the apprehension then for, for, you know, even athlete, anybody really to kind of speak out about it? Cause especially with social media these days, I mean, you, you're kind of judged by the words that you have and you alluded to that as well. Um, I, I, yeah, I guess I'm asking, I mean, I guess, do you feel that's part of the apprehension, I suppose? Probably. Um, I, I wish I didn't care what people thought of me. I do. And um, it, it's sort of exhausting, you know, especially as a captain of a team, you know, um, in the, in especially the way I'm wired, the way that I go about my business. Um, you know, I, I think that, that that's not really, you know, how, how I am day to day isn't really, um, a happy go lucky, like best friends, let's go get beers every day type of guy. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, yeah, you, you, you care what people think about you and you care that I, at least I do, you know, I, 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 I wish I didn't, but, um, when you're saying something like this, um, you need to not care and not to say that I, I all of a sudden just flip the switch and don't care anymore, but, um, it matters more to me to say what I feel than it does to have a bunch of people think that think poorly about me for feeling this way. I guess that that's the most important thing. And, and that's the most important thing in this whole situation is, is feeling okay with how you feel and feeling okay with voicing that opinion and the rest of it, it is what it is. I remember being there in Winnipeg in 2018 when you guys had the run to the, the conference final and just the energy in the building and, and all that went with it. I'm just wondering how you think teams are going to have to manufacture that or can you manufacture that in an empty, in an empty barn when there will be as much on the line, but it's just going to be a completely different atmosphere. It's going to be different. I mean, there's, there's no question about that. I mean, having fans in the stands and, um, you know, during that run, the three teams we played, Minnesota, Nashville, Vegas. I mean, you could argue in the Western Conference, there's only one other one other building and it's in Winnipeg that has a better crowd than those three. Um, so uh, that was special, you know, playing in Nashville game seven, everything on the line was special. Playing in Vegas, you know, during that run was, was special. Um, so it's, yeah, it's going to be different. And I think the team or the teams that, uh, get over that the quickest and, you know, buy into, to, you know, the format and the, the fact that it's not changing, you know, we just got to get on with it and, um, and realizing that there's a lot of people watching, you know, there's not going to be anyone physically in the crowd and the environment's going to be completely different in the building. But um, I mean, people, people need an outlet right now. There's going to be a lot of people watching those games. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. You, you, uh, talked about this off the top about how this is, you know, an issue you don't think should be politicized. And, you know, you'll see a lot on social media of people saying this is something we, you know, should, why is it so hard for us to agree that, you know, racism is a bad thing, but yet it seems like a lot of times these issues get co-opted 
into a right wing, left wing kind of battle. I, I don't want to get too deep into this, but you, you know, talked really openly about how it can be difficult to talk about these things sometimes. Do you think the fact that these things do get politicized and, and there's, you know, basically people on one side and the other, does that make it harder to talk about these issues, not just uh, uh, for yourself or other professional athletes like you, but just people in general, in your opinion? I mean, my, my opinion is whether, you know, whether you love Donald Trump or you love Bernie Sanders, and I use those names because political spectrum, they're probably on opposite ends. But um, I mean, either way, I think we can all agree that this is a problem and, you know, human rights should um, apply to everyone, you know, whether, whether, whether I'm voting Democrat or I'm voting Republican, I think I can find a candidate on either side that this is um, important to and, you know, agrees with the fact that um, this needs to stop. So that, that's, where, that's where I say I don't find this to be a political issue, even though the next step of it is, even though, you know, when it comes to voting, it clearly is very political. But, um, you know, if you're if you're on the right side of the spectrum, I, I, I truly believe that there's candidates out there that you can find that are, um, you know, on the, that, that are in agreement with, with what's happening right now. And Blake, it feels weird to ask questions about hockey because as you've mentioned, there, there's so much more important things going on. Um, but I, I guess I'll do it anyway. Um, you guys were, you know, I think right where you wanted to be when things were leaving, you were playing the way you wanted to um, finding yourselves as a team. Um, is, is that advantage that you'd created for yourselves? Is that gone if we restart things because of the amount of time that's, that, that, that it's going to be between being on the ice then and now? I, I think there's a good vibe on our team. I think, I think even, you know, the time that we've had off the, you know, the calls that we've had together and stuff like that. Um, there's a good vibe on our team. There really is. You know, I think um, we, we left with a good feeling and I'm not saying that we're going to hit the ice and just, you know, snap our fingers and it's going to be right back. But um, I, I, I like the, I like the way our team feels right now. And I'm not sure how that's going to translate on the ice or not, but um, I guess that's, that's as good as I can give you. Like, thanks uh, just for this one more. Mike's doing a story on the, the challenges of, I mean, the social distancing is not something that you can really do in hockey. Uh, do you anticipate there having to be any changes? I mean, baseball's talking about outlawing spitting and sunflower seeds. Or Do you think the game will look much different? Or do you think that being in a strict bubble would alleviate some of those concerns? Are we talking no hitting? I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think with the nature of our game, I mean, if we're going to talk about not being able to hit each other and, and other things and there's no point in playing, you know what I mean? Um, so I think that the challenge is going to be getting everyone into, you know, said bubble and getting everyone tested and, and having it be that, you know, we're all on the same page and, you know, try to, try to nip it in the bud before we get there. But, you know, whether that's possible or not, I'm not sure. Hey, Mr. Wheeler, Bartley Kivas here at CBC. How concerned are you about the, the threat of state violence in the U.S.? The threat of what? State violence, potential state violence. State violence? Correct. Uh, can you elaborate? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, right now we see police services uh, and... Uh, Police service is actually engaging in, in violence in some places. We also see uh, the U.S. president threatening to bring in the military. As a citizen, how much does this concern you? A, a lot. I mean, violence um, in any way is, um, yeah, it's nerve-wracking. There's no question. Um, you know, and I think what you know what happened last night in Washington with uh with the president was unfortunate and kind of just pours gas on the fire a little bit so I, I don't I don't think anyone's condoning you know rioting and, and and looting and destroying businesses and and, and that behavior 
Um, so on the flip side of that, you know, the, the whole issue that started this is police violence. And I, I don't think anyone's condoning police violence as well. I think, you know, the most positive things that have come out of this have been, you know, police officers joining in protest or joining in walking with protesters or hugging them or, you know, those are the types of things that we need more of. If we can, if we can have, you know, the police acknowledging the pain that people are going through and, and sort of uh, latching onto that and, and embracing it, I, I think that that's a step in the right direction. And I think then, you know, hopefully the violence can start to subside and, you know, we can start turning the page and, and trying to look forward to, you know, the next step in, in, in making this a, a really positive movement and one that, that holds, that sticks, that, that, that truly changes things. So um, to answer your question, you know, you know, say two wrong, two wrongs don't make a right. Well, I, I don't, you know, using force and using violence is just promoting more violence in my opinion. So I think that there needs to be um, more empathy, more love and more compassion for one another. We can start moving forward. Yeah, so uh, just on a hockey note, how concerned are you about the prospect that in Canada as a jurisdiction, it could be, frankly, years before we see f fans in the stands? Um, yeah, the, I mean, you know, you, the, one of the great thrills in playing professional sports is hopping onto the ice and having 20,000 people cheering for you, you know, um, I mean, that's, that that's what gives you chills sometimes when you go on the ice and you know my memories of the first time going on the ice in a playoff game in Winnipeg um you know some of the playoff moments we've had in Winnipeg even our first game coming back in Winnipeg were some of my fondest uh, memories that I'll cherish the rest of my life um so yeah it's that's you, you know especially in Canada I mean Canada's love for hockey is you know it doesn't need to be stated we need we need Canadian fans in the stands. Clearly, um, they're a big part of of our of our league. So um, I guess you can just be hopeful that that's not the case, and um, you know we can start turning the page on this hopefully sooner than later. But you know I know that that probably sounds ignorant too, because because um, you don't know when the end's going to be. But speaking for our fans, you know we we love having them in the building, and we miss playing for them.